the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, The Deadly Midge, special, a stroll along the Sun City, and Metal Beasts, the long-awaited Thunderbolt. The Wind of Change update is already available to all players, which means it's time to talk about the new vehicles it brought. Our first metal beast in this series lays claims to being the loudest new machine, uh, in all its meanings. And judging by your comments, might also be one of the most requested ones in War Thunder. Please welcome the legendary American Attack aircraft, the Fairchild Republic A-10A Thunderbolt II. We'd sometimes make fun of the creative names the armies give to new vehicles, but this machine truly earned it. The highlight of this vehicle is the 30mm 7-barreled Avenger autocannon installed in the nose with an ammo pool exceeding 1,000 rounds. The aircraft is propelled by two turbofan engines mounted on the tail. Self-sealing fuel tanks occupy the central part of the fuselage and the space between the wing spars. Bulletproof glass and a titanium capsule protect the pilot from enemy fire. The aircraft can also carry bombs of various calibers, rockets, and, of course, guided air-to-air -air and air-to-surface munitions. Despite being pretty modern, the A-10's flight performance is noticeably lower than that of its counterparts. You can compare its acceleration and maximum speeds to the earliest jet fighters. The only thing that can save the Warthog in an air battle are four all-aspect IR-guided missiles and a huge number of countermeasures. But even that kind of offensive and defensive equipment provides little efficiency. Any opponent can simply thrust away and break the distance any time they'd want to. Mixed battles, however, are just the kind of environment to enjoy the Thunderbolt's full capabilities. This machine was created to destroy ground vehicles. Need to suppress anti-air defenses? Sure, here's some Mavericks for ya. Need to stop a bunch of light vehicles? Get some rockets, get a whole bunch of them. Got a mission to bomb a group of tanks? Here's some classic ordnance for you. Choose any size you want. What do you mean it's too boring? We'll spin the wheel then. Or more like, spin the 30mm Gatling gun. 4,200 shots a minute and a high penetration rate even at long distances. That's bound to become everyone's favorite. And the special part about it is that all your anti-air measures aren't going anywhere. Of course, the poor flight performance limits this American plane's CAS capabilities too. It can't quickly gain some altitude, attack a SAM, and leave the combat zone. Better leave that to the multi-role fighters. But when anti-air defense is suppressed, Nothing gets in the way of ultra-low altitude CAS, and the Warthog is unequaled in this. Low speed becomes your advantage, giving you more time to aim, and a great level of maneuverability allows you to exit dives very close to the ground. It happened on the 25th of March 1943. The Soviet Malia Zemlya outpost was a thorn in the German side. And they were throwing everything they could into destroying this deplorable obstacle. Meanwhile, the Black Sea Fleet had the task of supplying the outpost with anything it might need. The task was gargantuan considering the Germans had air superiority. After all, you could only supply so much using torpedo boats, and only at night. On that day, a small MO4 class guardship designated 
Ska 65, commanded by Lieutenant Pavel Sivenkor, had to escort a shabby trawler under the name of Achilion. Both vessels were on their way to Malia Zimlia, making it from the city of Tuapse to Gelenjik. The German schnellboats didn't risk delving into the range of coastal artillery, which meant some hope for the success of the operation. But the local Luftwaffe command was definitely suspicious. Maybe they thought Achillion was transporting command officers or some valuable cargo? <laughs> we'll never know. Anyway, a whole regiment of Junkers 87 dive bombers was sent to destroy the old trawler. Approaching the target, the dive bombers didn't pay Ska 65 much attention at first. A small guard ship? A <laughs> big deal. You can't even spot it much among the waves of a Force 7 storm. The Achillion, on the other hand, was there in full view. All they had to do was approach it and dump the deadly loads. They had more than enough to hit it eventually, and definitely enough to sink the old shabby boat. But approaching was where they had some difficulties. The small guardship, barely distinguishable among high waves, opened devastating fire from all calibers. The Junkers had to urgently scatter, each in their own way. When one of them lost half a wing and hit the water, the German pilots realized they had to deal with the annoying Ska-65 before sinking a Helion. And then all the fury of the howling Stukas focused on the tiny guardship. The bombs were constantly dropping around the wildly maneuvering boat. All the while, its own guns and cannons firing non-stop at the attackers. The Germans were trying to destroy it again and again, but they couldn't score a good hit. Meanwhile, another Junkers caught fire and dived into the sea. No one even remembered about the Achillion anymore. Sinking the MO4 became a matter of principle. That principle led to another lost plane. The rest got so many holes and burnt so much fuel in the hour of the battle that there was a risk of not making it back home. The Soviet hunter, this damned piece of wood would not sink despite heavy damage. Just one more shot and it was too late. They had to turn back to the airfield. But by that time, Soviet fighters were already on their course to intercept the Junkers. The heavily damaged Scar 65, all cut up with shrapnel and missing most of its crew, was still making its slow way to Gilenji, and ultimately did end up there. Soon after the battle, the Sea Hunter was awarded the honorary Guards title. It was the first ever Rank 4 Soviet ship to receive it. Besides the long-awaited vehicles, the Wind of Change update brought many more new things. And one of them is the Sun City, a new location for mixed battles. Our artists were inspired with the plethora of landscapes, architecture, and the nature of the coastal Middle East. Let's have a look around this new location and learn a thing or two to better navigate it in your first battles here. Okay, what do we have here? Point A is found in the western part of the map, at the heart of the industrial area. Despite being adjacent to the desert, this place is unfavorable for long-distance shots, too dense with buildings. The hangar and the warehouses reduce visibility. They also make a ring around a small plantation, and the capture zone is right in the middle of it. There are only three ways to get inside the ring, so taking and controlling the industrial area might become a tricky task. Mobile machines will have an advantage. They might run through the urban maze and take favorable positions first. Going east, the industrial area transitions into a residential one. 
Compact rectangular housing, simple block planning, and wide streets are easy enough to navigate even for the most absent-minded tankers. Long open spaces with no cover promote early contact with the enemy, first visual, then fire. Moving further east, we see the urban sprawl thicken, with some office buildings springing up. A large road junction is built right in the center of the city among them. And right beneath it, we see point B. You can capture it both on the ground and above it, but chances are you'll need to clear it thoroughly first. The walls do provide some cover, but there's still quite a few firing lines. Crossing the railroad that splits the city into halves, we get to the coastal area. Close to the spawn points, we see the already familiar wide streets and the central part houses the largest building on this map, a 220-meter-high skyscraper. Right below it, we see a small recreational area tightly surrounded by residential and office buildings on all sides. You can only reach it from the north and the south. All other directions are blocked by concrete walls. Nearby, we can see Point C, and further, the promenade and the beach that go along the whole city. Combat distances may exceed a kilometer here, so it's sensible to say you need some really powerful guns and reliable armor before heading to it. Here, next to the warm blue sea, our tour has come to an end. How do you feel about this new location? Share your impressions, favorite positions, and newly discovered tactical ideas. We'll be happy to read them all. Meanwhile, we'll get to answering some of the questions you ask us in the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Wood0i0123, <laughs> that could be Wood0io123. How do you not join ongoing battles? Hi there. It's pretty simple. Just go to Options, Main Parameters, Common Battle Settings, and set Join Already Active Battles to No. Arc Blitz asks, why is the A6M called a zero? Hi Blitz. The A6M was actually called Navy Type Zero Carrier Fighter. After its creation year, the Imperial Year of 2600. That's how it got its short name, Zero. Another question comes from Erufish. How do you play the A21RB? Hello Erufish. Similar to how you play other early jets. The best move here is energy tactics. Don't lose your speed. The A21RB is also great as an attack aircraft. Wojtak Kojewski writes, How low can the Type 10's gun go with the use of its suspension? Hi there. You can use the suspension to significantly improve your depression angle, up to minus 15 degrees. And the last comment for today was written by Krypton. When will the Puma IFV be added? Hi Krypton. Good news everyone! The Puma is already available. Tell us what you think of it in the comments. Well, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Ah, you know the blurb. Don't forget to leave a like, check out the new vehicles, have a leisurely stroll along the Sun City, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.